In my Church of England days, that's uh, some 50 years back in my life now, I used to reflect occasionally, not very often, on the fact that when I died, I would somehow disappear as a disembodied soul to heaven, apparently playing a harp, a solo harp, it seemed, on a cloud, a pink cloud, should we say. And that whole prospect seemed quite uninteresting to me, as I think it does to millions of other people. In my professional life as a teacher in a Bible college, I've done something quite different. The whole point, and I mean the whole point of biblical Christianity, is that Jesus is going to reign on a renewed earth when he comes back. It's impossible to explain the New Testament. You begin to explain it. In the absence of the parousia, the future coming of Jesus, a single event, no pre-tribulation rapture in Scripture, one single coming after the, after the Great Tribulation, at that point, Jesus then will take up governorship over the world and the nations will beat their swords into plowshares. This is more than obvious as we read the prophets. The question arises then, who's going to govern whom in that millennial reign of Revelation 20, which I would call the first stage of the manifested church of... the first stage of the manifested kingdom of God, which will begin at the return of Christ, that is, parousia, after the great tribulation and the heavenly signs. Jesus made a very interesting statement. In fact, he made a number of interesting statements in describing the rewards offered to the faithful in the churches, the seven churches he addresses in the book of Revelation. And I'll start with the one in Revelation 2 because it's particularly, because it's particularly explicit. And that one says, to the one who overcomes and holds on to my truth, my gospel, till the end. Here's the reward he gets. I will give him authority over the nations to rule them, govern them, shepherd them with a rod of iron. And he then says, that's the authority exactly that was given to him by the Father. He shares that authority, <coughs> even to discipline the nations rather vigorously and to shatter them like earthenware. This is an extraordinarily interesting passage. Quoting, of course, from Psalm 2, famous messianic psalm, that the sun is going to be placed on Mount Zion in that future kingdom, and there will take place a very vigorous and resolute disciplining of the nations to bring them in line. And they're advised there to kiss the sun, to submit to the sun, and learn to live right and govern right. Now, back to this statement in 2 26 and 27 of Revelation. Note that Jesus says, I'll give you authority over the nations. Now we all know, I think, that at the first resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, all the Christians of all the ages, all the faithful of all the ages, including the father of the faithful, Abraham himself, will be immortalized. They will gain immortality in a split second at the seventh trump, which is at the arrival of Jesus, as he appears in the sky and the saints go up to meet him and escort him in the direction in which he's going, which is the earth, of course. They are then immortalized. How then can we say that in that millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign which follows immediately after the great event of the Parousia, how can we say that there will be nations to be ruled over? Clearly, we don't have immortals ruling immortals. That makes no sense at all. And the statement of Jesus, of course, should be enough for the believer, because when we hear Jesus speak, we're supposed to react in faith, in simplicity of faith and obedience. There will be nations. How can that be? Well, the fact is quite clear that at the second coming, the day of the Lord, which will be, may I say, no picnic, it will be a vast depopulation of the world, as in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 6. Few people will be left, but there'll be some left. And they're the ones then who will form the nucleus of a new popular name. They will form the nucleus of a new population which will repopulate the world, just as after the flood, eight men or eight folk, I should say, eight souls, not eight men, but eight persons, came out of the ark and began to repopulate the world. Exactly the same pattern will follow at the second coming. So Jesus then gives authority over existing nations. These are mortals who enter the kingdom of God, not as immortals, but needing to be supervised, needing to be under a system of government, which will be a perfect system of government at that time. 
Let's look at this in further detail. In Matthew 25, we find a particular judgment. It's not the judgment of the faithful and the unfaithful, which will have taken place the moment Christ appears in the sky, where the faithful, that is, get the reward of immortality, the reward of the inheritance. It's not that judgment. But when the Messiah is sitting on his throne, as we read at the end of Matthew 25, and all the nations who still exist, who are still alive through that process, are gathered before him. Some of them are selected, some individuals, masculine, aftus, not nations, but individuals from those nations, are then arraigned and judged on the basis of how well they treated the Christians. And those who treated the Christians badly, those are the brothers and sisters of Jesus, suffer the fate of the lake of fire, which exists at the beginning of the millennium, as well as afterwards. Those who did well, who were kind and generous to the Christians, are allowed to enter the kingdom, presumably not as immortals, but as mortals. And there would be some of those, at least, who would survive into that thousand years to provide the populations of cities. And remember that in Luke chapter 19, what reward is offered to those who serve Christ well, who developed their talents well, precisely take authority over five cities, ten cities, and so on take charge of them. There you have the mortal population surviving. Now in Isaiah 19 you'll find there are nations. Assyria and Egypt are said to be blessed are my people along with Israel the nation. Assyria and even Egypt are collective national Christian groups if you like. They've submitted to Messiah and they're repentant and allowed to survive to form nations. So there are the nations. The problem here is that Christians don't conceive of the future with any clarity. They seem to have fallen under the erogenistic notion that the only real meaning of scripture is the non-literal one. Erogen had this very spacey idea about how to deal with words. He considered the literal sense to be the least valuable at all. The second sense was moral, <laughs> teaching how to live. And then there's a further sense which has to do with, quote, heaven. Nothing then could be further removed from the biblical picture. Imagine a soccer game in which you are taught that to kick the ball as high in the air as you can is the object of the game. The higher you can kick the ball into the air, the more points you're scoring. We know that's nonsense. The real goal is to go into the goal between the white posts. It's a forward-looking goal. Now, Christians then are obsessed, it seems to me, with the idea of what happens the moment they die as immortal souls. And immortal soul itself is not a biblical idea. The much greater question, and the biblical question, is what happens in the resurrection, as to say the resurrection of the now sleeping dead, Daniel 12 verse 2, what happens to them when they rise from death and along with the living Christians are caught up in this post-tribulational rapture, the only catching up there is, to meet the Lord in the air as he descends to the earth. What happens to them? Well, they're asked then to take charge of five or ten cities, to rule with Christ. All the co-governorship texts in Scripture, and there are many of them, are in the future tense. In 1 Corinthians 4, it's actually a heresy to imagine that you're ruling now. Paul is very disturbed, very upset with those Corinthians who imagine that they're kings now, in the present evil age. Nothing could be further from the truth, because Paul says, look at me, I'm scum of the earth. I hardly have a place to stay. I'm homeless and naked and so on. No, you're not ruling as kings and queens now, but you will be governing as royal family in that future kingdom. That's the whole point of the reversal of the failure of Adam to take charge of the world. Jesus is the one who's qualified to take charge of the world, and he shares that kingdom as a central part of the new covenant. Think, for example, in Luke 22, at the Last Supper, they get to fighting on who's going to be in charge. And Jesus said, don't you know anything about the covenant? He says, I have covenanted, not just given, I have covenanted to give you the kingdom, just as my father covenanted, that's the new covenant, to give it to me. And you will sit on thrones, note, to administer, not to judge, that's a hopelessly limited English translation there, to administer, to govern, just as the judges did in the book of Judges, to govern and administer the regathered 12 tribes. What a brilliant text, Matthew 19, 28, Luke 22, 28. 
This gives you the picture then of a world which eventually will teem with people living right. In Isaiah 65, you couldn't have a more clear vision of this populated earth with immortals supervising. In, in that marvelous passage in Isaiah 65, verses 17 and following, you'll find that if a person is to die at 100, he would be dying prematurely. Just a kid, he's dying at 100. It suggests that people will be living, they're not immortals note, but they will be living as indeed before the flood they did for very long periods of time, and a man dying at 100 will be just a boy. And others dying at the age of 100 have not lived out their lives that would be expected in that time, but they're actually cursed. So two categories, some will live and die naturally at 100, but that will be considered a youth. Others will be punished in that millennium and actually come to the end of their lives under judgment at the age of 100. And it says they will build houses and outlive their houses. They will not build and somebody else steal that house. They will not create uh, agricultural successes and have somebody else wipe it out. On the contrary, everybody will be living straight and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. How vastly remote this is from the Church of England idea that I was given, if I was given any clear idea, and it wasn't that clear, about going to heaven. Let me give you the voice then of J.E.T. Robinson my mother's second cousin, incidentally, a rebel in some ways, and I certainly don't agree with everything he said, but he did say this fearlessly from Cambridge. Listen carefully to this statement. Heaven in the Bible is nowhere the destination of the dying. Well, you could have fooled me listening to funeral services and endless talk about heaven. No, heaven will be on the earth. The whole point of the kingdom of God is that it will be on the earth. So amplifying then this idea of co-rulership, think about Revelation 5 verse 10. Jesus has got together a group of international believers from all the nations and created them a group of king priests. That's exactly what Israel in the Old Testament was intended to be. In the new Israel of the new covenant, the new covenant people, this is an international body of priest kings and they are going to reign as kings, epitetis, I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation. That means, of course, on the earth. They're not just ruling over the earth from some distant planet. No, ruling on the earth because that's where the Messiah will be. People who talk about believing in the second coming really don't seem to believe in the second coming. They think that Jesus is doing a sort of a drive-through process where he comes to the sky and goes back to heaven. That's completely false. It does away with the messianic rule on the Davidic throne in Jerusalem in that grand day about which the prophets speak constantly. A man in 1959 wrote a book on Jesus and the future. He says, if in few, if any instances of the use of the word heaven in the Synoptic Gospels, is there any parallel with modern usage? That should shake us into the reality, the realization that what we're saying as Christians doesn't sound like the Bible remotely. Jesus doesn't talk about going to heaven. He always talks about inheriting the kingdom of God. The gospel records, says this writer, the gospel records of our Lord's life and teaching do not speak of going to heaven as a modern believer so naturally, and may I say so unnaturally, really, does, because he's claiming to follow the Bible and yet he doesn't sound like Jesus. Again, this writer says, our modern way of speaking of life with God as being life in heaven is not, and I repeat, not the way the Gospels speak of the matter, especially is there no suggestion at all that Jesus is offering his disciples heaven after this life. Think back to the book of Daniel, Daniel 7, where the Son of Man obtains authority to rule in the kingdom. And in verse 18, what do we find? The time arrives. We're talking about chronological time here. We're not talking about beyond history, which is meaningless. We're never talking about beyond time. We're never talking about the end of the world. We're talking about the end of the age and a new age following. And in that text in Daniel 7, 18, the time comes when the saints, that's the holy people of all the ages, will gain the kingdom. They'll be given the kingdom. That's quite specific and quite clear. Down in verse 27, you'll see that all nations are going to be required to submit to the rulership and governorship 
of those saints. That's an astonishing, if you like, Jewish supremacy thing originally. But the Jews having failed, at least to a large extent, to carry out that mandate, as you know, with Paul, the gospel of the kingdom goes internationally. So now the new Israel of God, which is an international body of believers in the true Messiah and the one God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they constitute then the cabinet, if you like, of the future government. They are the co-rulers, the royal family, you might say, of that coming age of peace and salvation, absence of war, even nature responding sympathetically, that wonderful, glorious future, which is so much more impressive than vague talk about going to heaven.